Hey, it's Anita, and this is the Anita Posh Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Anita Posh Show, where it is my pleasure to keep you up to date with topics around Bitcoin on a global stage and also the local impact it has on people like you and me. And it's World Press Freedom Day today. No better date than this to interview Gabriel Shipton. Gabriel is the brother of Julian Assange, and we are going to talk about the current state of his brother, who is currently locked up in Belmarsh High Security Prison, the connections between WikiLeaks and Bitcoin, and also the ideas that Julian very early on had on Bitcoin and how it can help free journalism. And we're also going to talk about the possibilities you my dear listener and viewers have um, to help Julian Assange in his case uh, against extradition to the US. You can listen to this episode in your favorite podcast player. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast and you can also watch it on YouTube. And uh, please re subscribe also to my channel here. And now a short word from my sponsors and then on to the show. Enjoy. Many people worry about the right storage for their Bitcoin. And yes, holding them isn't always easy. The safest way is offline, physically. That's why Coinfinity developed the Card Wallet, the professional and easy solution. Order it now at cardwallet.com slash Anita and get 20% off. Do you want to stay up to date with the things that happen in Bitcoin from my point of view? Then subscribe to Anita's Weekly. My newsletter with articles, videos, quotes, short tips on how to use Bitcoin and all that for free. Subscribe to Anita's Weekly at anita.link slash weekly. Hello, everybody. Hello, Gabriel Shipton. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. It's good to be here. Hello, Gabriel. We are here uh, because you are the stepbrother or half-brother of uh, Julian, Julian Assange. Uh, today is World Press Freedom Day. No better date than today to talk about his case. Can you uh, introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners and why uh, did you contact me? Because we started it because you contacted me. You wrote an article about uh, how Bitcoiners uh, should stand up for their brother, Julian. So, yeah, let's please um, explain a little bit about you. Okay, well, uh, my name is Gabriel Shipton. You know, I'm a filmmaker from Melbourne in Australia. I'm Julian Assange's half brother i guess uh, i sort of uh, joined this campaign to to fight for uh, julian's freedom in 2019 i went and saw him at belmarsh prison and um he he was on suicide watch at the time in in the health wing there after i left that visit i felt like if i didn't do something or if i didn't act then i, I might never see him again so that sort of uh, launched me on this journey, which I'm on at the moment, campaigning, you know, being part of the campaign, which is a global campaign to free Julian and, you know, specifically do a lot of outreach um, to the Bitcoin uh, community. When we are like me, when I'm watching this in the media, I'm always wondering, I mean, why does he have to be in this Belmarsh high security prison in uh, solitary uh, confinement and has almost no contact to the outside world uh, wouldn't it be enough to have him like in a house uh, kept uh, and and i mean in a in a way which is actually a human way and also even nils melzer the un united nations uh, rapporteur on torture and ill treatment said that he's basically punished and he is in a very bad state psycho psychologically yeah so why do you think is he there? You know, I guess you could compare him to like maybe, you know, the Chilean dictator Pinochet, who was he even he was allowed to to live under house or, you know, house arrest. Um, whereas Julian, Julian has been for the last 10 years, he's been suffering this persecution. He's there because of, of what he's published and, you know, the war crimes and and the corruption and and the torture that he has exposed and, and that's why he has been treated 
treat it this way, um, which is different to anyone else. My dad calls it a plague of malice. Um, you know, it's just every year it gets worse and worse what we find out about his treatment and, and how that's sort of happened to him and how all these states are complicit, like the, the UK, um, the USA, Australia and Sweden. Um, or complicit in, in the treatment of Julian. Mm -hmm. And what is the current state? I think on January the 4th, uh, there was the last judgment in, 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 in the UK. And what's the state now? What are they waiting for? On the 4th of January, uh, the UK magistrate rejected the extradition request from the US. Julian's charged with 17 counts of the Espionage Act uh, in, in the USA which total 175 years in prison. And the judge upheld all the points of law relating to those charges, but rejected the extradition based on Julian's health, you know, his, his mental health and his well-being, saying that if he was extradited to a prison in the US, that, uh, you know, it would be a death penalty for him because uh, he would likely suicide. You know, the sick part of it all is, is that after that ruling, Three days later, on January 6, the judge refused bail for Julian and sent him straight back to the conditions which have, um, you know, led to the deterioration of his well-being and, and, and the actual the judgment that he would be suicidal is because of the conditions that he's in and um, the judge just put him back in those conditions. Mm -hmm. And basically, I think he's the first journalist ever who is basically charged on the Espionage Act. Is this true? Yes, yes, that's right. So usually the Espionage Act is reserved and it's from 1917, the Espionage Act. So it's quite, you know, it's quite old. And, and over the last 20, 20 or so years, it's been used against whistleblowers. Actually, since um, Daniel Ellsberg published Pentagon, the Pentagon Papers, it's been used against whistleblowers almost exclusively. Um, you know, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, Snowden, um, Reality Winner, they're all charged under the Espionage Act. This is the first time that, that it's been used against a publisher. The Department of Justice has come up with this like workaround to sort of, you're committing espionage, publishing what the US government doesn't want you to know. But basically that's the thing what press freedom shall allow, that scandals like this getting out into the media and to the people. Yeah, that's exactly right. We all have the right to know what's being done in our name. We don't have press freedom and we don't have transparency of government. Uh, then, you know, do we, do we really live in, in a democracy? Exactly. And do, do, do you see the first effects of this, like, new danger for journalists? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're seeing the effects are seen by the editorial that's been published in support of Julian by places like the Washington Post and The Guardian. Uh, the New York Times has published opinion pieces in support of Julian. So media organizations are publishing these pieces because they're already seeing the effects of, of these charges. They have to consider now when a national security piece comes across their edit the editor's desk, they have to consider whether that will uh, land them an Espionage Act charge. You know, what we're seeing is this support from these papers, it's already having an impact. And then that's a flow on impact again to whistleblowers, because if I take this information to the press, then it might not even be published. So why as a whistleblower would you risk everything, risk your whole life? What you wanted to blow the whistle on was, was just remain secret because of these Espionage Act charges that can be applied anywhere. Uh, you know, Julian was in the UK when he, he wasn't even in the US. They're sort of being applied anywhere in the world. It could be the UK or it could be in Germany or it could be in France where they try to prosecute people for publishing under the Espionage Act. Mm -hmm. so, so the power of the US uh, stretches out to the whole world, basically. Yes, yeah, basically. And they, they're sort of using these extradition treaties that were put in place after 9-11 after to go after people like Julian, people who sort of draw the ire of, of the, of the United States, and, and they're, they're using that against technologists now as well. Uh, you've got Mike Lynch of the autonomy. It's Mike Lynch in the US, in, in the UK. Um, there's an extradition request against him. Uh, and, you know, Meng Wen Zhu in Canada, an extradition request against from Canada to the US. 
The, the danger is, is where does it stop? Anybody who runs afoul of the US government, even in overseas territories, could be subjected to this sort of treatment under these extradition treaties. And then on the other side, we, are in, the, we in the West are always like, oh, the press freedom here, everybody is so free and there's freedom of speech and everything. And China is so bad because they also punish basically the, the CEO and founder of Alibaba at the moment. I mean, he has not been seen for quite some time now. And yeah, because he, he got too powerful, I guess, for their... What's, what we're going to see happening now as well, or we're already seeing happening is, um, you know, uh, the UK, uh, the USA, um, you know, Sweden, Australia, these countries that are all involved in this have lost their moral high ground when dealing with countries like China or, or other sort of regimes around the world. In Azerbaijan, the Azerbaijani leader was being questioned about his record on prisoning journalists. And he said to the interviewer, well, you know, what about Assange? What, look at what you're doing to Assange. You, how, who are you to lecture me on press freedoms when you're, you know, locking up Assange uh, in a prison? And, and you've got, uh, you know, like US allies like Saudi Arabia, who, uh, you know, have, this has given them license to sort of even murder journalists in foreign countries. They killed uh, Khashoggi in, in an embassy in Turkey. And mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, they look at they look at what the US is doing to Julian and they, that's an example that's set for the rest of the world. Yeah, exactly. And they still support, I think it was Saudi Arabia who killed uh, Khashoggi. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they are all together in this protecting their right to the oil and the petrodollar. And you could also see how the power of the US, uh, how strong it is when uh, WikiLeaks was banned in, was it 2010 or 2011 from receiving donations? Yeah, that's right. After they released uh, the Iraq war logs and the Afghan war logs, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, They came under sort of uh, this intense political pressure to cut off donations to WikiLeaks, and they did. It was a an extra legal financial blockade that, you know, totally constricted flow of funds uh, of donations to WikiLeaks. PayPal closed WikiLeaks's account. Um, WikiLeaks had a balance in the account, and PayPal just, you know, just closed the account, and, and WikiLeaks could no longer access their PayPal. Julian's personal bank accounts were closed. It was a really, um, you know, all-encompassing financial blockade of WikiLeaks at that time. Um, they were able to keep their websites going, but that's that's when they sort of when they looked to um, Bitcoin. If you look back on the uh, Bitcoin message boards, there's posts from Satoshi saying, you know, Bitcoin's in beta mo in beta phase. Please don't adopt uh, Bitcoin right now, and that was in 2010. Julian and WikiLeaks waited uh, six months uh, and, and Bitcoin was able to level up in that time. And then in 2011, in June, they adopted Bitcoin as basically their operating currency and they started taking donations in Bitcoin. It was their operating cash. That, that's what they used to operate um, WikiLeaks and it, they were able to use Bitcoin uh, to keep publishing, to keep their servers going, to keep paying their staff. They were able to, you know, publish, you know, this, uh, Syrian government correspondence, Saudi Arabian diplomatic cables, you know, CIA spying material, like how the CIA hacks into your phone, your television, your computers, all that was published basically because they were able to keep going because of Bitcoin. <laughs> And if you look at it from Bitcoin's perspective, WikiLeaks was really the first use case for Bitcoin as freedom of speech money, you know, money that couldn't be silenced. The most powerful government in the world couldn't stop WikiLeaks using Bitcoin. That was great for Bitcoin. I get, it brought a lot of attention and, and really sort of Yeah, it was a, a great use case for it as uh, freedom of speech money. Exactly. It shows the potential and that it works. And I think Julian worked in the Ecuadorian embassy all the time. How many people are actually working for WikiLeaks? Is there, do you know, is this a group of people uh, where we don't know the names and who they are? How does this work? Yeah, do you know that? Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, yeah. There, there are a few core people, uh, you know, Kristen Harrison's the editor-in-chief now. There is a large network. Uh, obviously, some of them have to Uh, you know, Julian was really the lightning rod for WikiLeaks. He said that in interviews before that he's the lightning rod for the organization. So lightning rod takes electricity away from the building so the building can survive. So, mm. um, you know, that's what, for better or for worse. And, 
Yeah, and the others, are they not scared that they also might get some legal charges pressed on them? Well, I guess, uh, yeah, I would imagine they are, yeah. And uh, does WikiLeaks still operate on or with uh, Bitcoin? Yes, yeah, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I mean, as far as I have uh, read, Julian was very early a supporter of Bitcoin or he very early on realized the potential of it. Do you know something from that time? I mean, did you speak with him back then about it or did he tell you something about it? How did you see that evolving? He was on the cipher punk mailing list i think in the you know from the, the the early 90s so that's where the sort of you know the philosophy of bitcoin and wikileaks are sort of intertwined in that way um they, they're both born of the of that sort of amazing mailing list i don't know if you right it's pretty incredible so yeah he's been always uh, very intrigued and interested in bitcoin uh, cryptocurrency and other other forms of currency and you know watched it develop over the years you know since their sort of beginnings they've been intertwined in this sort of way of they share a lot of the same philosophy in you know decentralization transparency those sorts of those sorts of things you know but wikileaks gives you documents it's like a public ledger for for source documents basically usually um, source documents are held by media organizations and they choose what to report on and what to publish. But uh, WikiLeaks uh, makes the source documents available to everyone. There's no central organization governing whether you get to see the source documents or not. WikiLeaks makes it available uh, to everybody, just as the Bitcoin ledger is available to everybody to verify. And that's, I think, a really mm -hmm. interesting um, parallel between the between the two things and, and and it's rooted in that cypherpunk philosophy yes and that's as you say yeah the the, the interconnection between bitcoin and uh, wikileaks and the documents that nobody can take down that's basically the the most interesting and yeah effective thing about that i saw a speech from uh, julian at the oslo freedom forum in 2010 Yes. Where he he's saying, uh, I'm reading that now, we are now approaching the state of Orwell's dictum, perfect dictum, that he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the internet service controls the intellectual record of mankind. And by controlling that controls our perception of who we are. And by controlling that controls what laws and regulations we make in society. Yeah. And... Um, He also called Bitcoin the most interesting intellectual development on the internet in the last years. Yeah. And so the connection is also that you basically could or can connect public papers with the Bitcoin blockchain. So they get a unique timestamp. So you can't remove, yeah, you can't change uh, the history. Do you know of examples? Does Has WikiLeaks done that? I think there's one entry in the blockchain. Yeah, I, actually, I, I'm not sure if there's an example. I know, I know, um, you know, Julian talked about, there's a, Julian's, one of Julian's books, When Google Met WikiLeaks, he discussed that with Eric Schmidt, the, the idea that you would attach a hash to an idea and then it's a publicly verifiable on a blockchain or, or a public ledger. There's no going back and changing it um, because, you know, obviously with, uh, you know, other, other sites, people, newspapers go back and change things, change headlines or, or do things all the time. Uh, you know, make edits, and and they're getting they're getting worse and worse at at telling you, you know, whether something's been changed or not. So that that was like yeah, like you said, something that Julian thought about thought about a lot, and one of the one of the real potentials that that he saw in uh, you know blockchain technology. As far as I know, there are two services online. One is called Open Timestamps. And one is called proof of existence, where basically everybody uh, can publicly prove the existence of documents without revealing the data. And it's also for free. So you can go there, you can take a document, you can timestamp it, and you have forever the proof of existence at that date, yeah. which is a, a great tool. Yeah. And yeah, actually yeah. everybody can use it. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's, it's great. I mean, and we're seeing, uh, you know, like there's, With NFT, you know, with NFTs, the the adoption of that that is is another sort of instance of, of something that is a you know a singular sig signature related to an artwork or, or an idea or or anything. So yeah, it's uh, going to be. Uh, I think it's 
the adoption will just ex keep expanding of, of that. Yeah. I, I think so too. And I mean, many people at the moment bash NFTs for it's just a bubble and nobody needs it. But I think they don't see the, the, the basics behind so that it's basically cryptography and public and private keys um, where you can uh, like hold a unique timestamp also to a document. So I think it's a uh, yeah, very important technology, as you say. And I mean, let's hope that uh, Julian <laughs> will, will be able to, to use it and, and yeah, get out of the situation soon. Because you, you spoke out in that article about why and how Bitcoiners should support his case. Um, and you also brought some examples what what Julian did for Bitcoin as we uh, were talking now, before now, but also I think you mentioned something with Craig Wright. Oh yeah, Craig. Craig. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, he's sort of, uh, you know, Julian and WikiLeaks have been uh, defending Bitcoin against you know Craig Wright for for years, uh, you know, and his confidence scams and exposing him you know when he's gone back and tried to change documents in the past um you know uh, julian even confronted that if you go back to the cypherpunk mailing list there's um julian's confronted him there as well so over the years uh you know i think you know he's julian's defended uh bitcoin from from those sort of confidence attacks so you're saying that Craig Wright, uh, even back in the days, uh, said he's Satoshi? No, 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 uh, no, at all. Uh, I think, um, anyway, I'll let you go back and explore explore the cyberpunk mailing <laughs> yeah. list to, to find that. Yes, that's, yeah. <laughs> to find the reference. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you're also talking about the fact that basically also bloggers, podcasters like me or YouTubers uh, are all put like in danger if if Julian would be extradited. Yeah, that's right. I mean, people, bloggers, podcasters, they don't they don't have the backup of these big media organizations. You know, they don't have teams of legal people or all these sort of things to defend them. They're even more more vulnerable and and that's where people are getting you know a lot more people are getting their information from from you know there's less and less trust in these media organizations now and a lot more people are getting their information from bloggers and podcasters and youtubers than than they were you know a few years ago so i think they're even more vulnerable than 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 the big the big media organizations to this prosecution and i think really you know what 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 it's really you know when we sort of boil it down, it's, it's, you know, this is a sort of test case of, of, you know, how free is the internet really? If this, if this prosecution is allowed to go forward, you know, it's going to just constrict everything. It's not just the media organizations, not just bloggers, but it's the actual, the basic tenets of net neutrality are sort of under threat and whether, whether the internet will be something that is used to control, you know, civilization or can it be used for the betterment of civilization, you know, which is what Bitcoin and what, what Julian sort of, you know, set about to do by, you know, seeing the potential to, for the internet to uh, make better societies around the world, freer societies where people are more educated, where people have freedom to transact with, without a central authority that, that is controlled by a few powerful people. Back then, I mean, it used to be when, or look, looking back into the, we only have the offline world, the real world. Back then, we people had secrets and the government was transparent, but now it's uh, the same, the other, the other way around. We people lack privacy and the government has secrets. And they are using basically also the financial infrastructure to surveil us because all those KYC uh, and AML regulations, I mean, they, they went completely overboard in the last years. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, bank, the banking system is policing us all the time. I mean, instead of just looking at the people or the, the companies or individuals where there's a, a case of, uh, yeah, maybe they've done something wrong. Now let's go into it. Yeah. 
So I really think uh, that Bitcoin and uh, also now the taproot um, changes are hopefully taking place soon and get into effect uh, later this year, which gives Bitcoin more privacy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important because if Bitcoin doesn't get more private than it is now, then I think we're a little bit doomed. <laughs> and so I think that freedom of payments basically is freedom of transaction is also freedom of speech. And it's a very important need and, and right that uh, we have as individuals. And so, yeah, I think it's really important to support Julian also in his case. And what are the things that like individuals like me or our listeners, what can we do to support him? I think just sort of talking amongst each other is probably the first step, uh, you know, like uh, discussing the different things, you know, correcting people on where they might have things wrong or or coming up with ideas together. That That's probably the, the first step I, I think that a lot of people can take. Obviously, with the Bitcoin community and the sort of, you know, I guess the flippening approaching where Bitcoin billionaires now will sort of, the price goes up past 100,000, will outnumber conventional billionaires. They really, the Bitcoin community really has to choose how they're going to wield, wield their power, you know, that they have. And, and are they going to use it to support people like Julian, who, who is a canary in the coal mine, this sort of erosion of our, of our basic rights? So I think that's a really a decision like that they have to make, that, they, that the Bitcoiners have to, you know, decide, are they going to support this and, and how can they do that? And they can do that by donating Bitcoin to the Assange, to Assange's, you know, the Assange defense, uh, which they can do at through the uh, support assange.vauland.de. That's W-A-U-L-A-N-D.de. I will put that in the show notes at anita.link slash 112. I will put the website of the Wauland. It's in, in German uh, foundation. I yes. didn't know. I didn't know this uh, that there's a German foundation supporting the WikiLeaks and Julian Assange case for many years now. Yes, that's right. Yep. What do they do? Do you know them? They support freedom of expression. Uh, so they're so they're big supporters of freedom of expression around the world. They supported Chelsea Manning. They supported Edward Snowden. One of the big supporters of freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And I read that even the donations are totally legal and tax deductible. Yes, and, yeah, tax deductible uh, that... in Germany. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, in Germany, not for the U for US um, uh, no, it's donors. No, it's a foundation, so they can give, probably give you a, a receipt, but it might not be so useful on your US taxes. Mm -hmm. I understand. So the call for our listeners is go out, speak about it, speak on, on Twitter about it, um, remind your friends and uh, followers to donate, donate yourself. Julian Assange's connection to Bitcoin is quite clear and also to the cypherpunk ethos. And I would like to close with a quote from Julian uh, saying, cryptography is the ultimate form of non-violent direct action. It's time to take up the arms of our new world to fight for ourselves and for those we love. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So, thank you very much, Gabriel for this discussion and um yeah i have you not met julian since 2019 no i saw him i saw him in october last year after i was the last one to visit him and then the prison stopped in-person visits so they have he hasn't had any uh any in-person visits from his family or lawyers he hasn't been able to see his, his lawyers even uh since october last year so uh, you can imagine you're trying to fight an extradition case against the U.S. government and you can't even see your lawyers. It's uh, pretty dire for them. Yeah, that's a scandal, frustrating and depressing at all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So let's hope for the best. All the best to you, the campaign, to WikiLeaks, uh, to Julian. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thanks so much for joining the Anita Posh Show today to learn more about Bitcoin. You can find the show notes for this conversation on anita.link slash show. If you want to get the best stories in Bitcoin from my point of view in your mailbox, 
go to anita.link slash weekly and subscribe. And if you have a question or just want to send me some feedback, drop me a line at hello at anitaposch.com. See you next week when it's time for the Anita Posch Show. Music, start with yes, delicate beats. Content, idea and production, Anita Posch. <laughs>